Welcome to today's 3D print. Um, I got some neat stuff I did today. As you know, I did. Yeah, I can get some more light. There we go. Let's get more light for you. Um, I did the astronaut. I want you to get a nice close up of him. That's on the one house duplicator i3. And then I did him again on the Ender 2. And he came out amazing. Very cool. This is in the Zyro fluorescent orange. As you can see, the Duplicator 3 actually did a good job. This is not a bad print at all. Although the Ender, even with worse cooling, did a better job on the fingers. Not by much, though. What is different is the surface finish on um, the, the Duplicator i3. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but you can see the striations, the layering in the leg. The print is clean, the detail is there, but you can definitely see the layers in the legs, for example. The whole model, really, even his face. I'm not sure how well that's showing up. Oh, there he is. I can see it, so you probably can, too. But then you look at the Ender 2, and it's almost impossible to see the layer striations. It looks like a solid. It really is quite phenomenal how good this printer is. Is that printing? Yes, it is. When you get sequential print going, I want to make sure I got the next layer. Very, very cool. Has a little trouble here, both of them do, because it's a dead overhang. It prints like that. And so this is a hard overhang. I'd like to go into the model and see if I can modify that somehow to remove that harsh overhang. Or at least put a couple of little divots there to give it something to grab onto when it prints that part. It's not bad, I mean, it's not a big deal, but it would be nice to be able to clean that up a bit. Then I got something really cool to show you. Um, where's the other one? There it is. These didn't come out so great because there's not a lot there, but they work, okay? This, however, came out fantastic. Uh, and even doing this on the Enid A10, it still came out amazing. Even at the, low, the lower quality I can expect from that, it still came out amazing. This is called a lithophane. There's a whole bunch of people doing videos on these. I actually, uh, uh, I believe RC Life on is the one who showed me the web page that allows you to do the curved ones. I wish I could figure out a local way to do this because that website is very unstable. Probably because we're all hammering it to do this. <laughs> you can see the way a lithophane works is by varying the thickness of plastic based on the color of whatever's there or the darkness of whatever's there. Thicker plastic, less light goes through, darker. My battery might die but let's see if it holds out for me. I want to show you this. So here's the lithophane, and now watch what happens. Look at that. An actual photograph is visible, and it's a clean photograph. That is Vernon Glita Estes. They're kind of um, celebrities in model rocketry. This is at Naram 59 this past summer, in, a month ago. And look at that. Out of the light, it's just plastic 3D print. In the light, it's a photograph. Isn't that cool? These two are the pictures of the um, the eclipse that I took. So this is when it first started and you can actually see the sunspots on there. The one how duplicator i3 is not good at these and this is the maximum for our area. And that's what it looked like. That's the, the most we got. Pretty cool. Sorry about that battery died. <laughs> the other print, which I have to redo, is the shuttle from Deep Space Nine. This one's trashed. I did not run this through NetFab. As expected, it's a whole bunch of individual pieces, so you have all kinds of gaps when the slicer tried to integrate multiple pieces. And that's support material. So it's, it's, it's trash. You can see this has got missing parts. I've run it through NetFab. That'll take care of that, so I'll reprint this. I think I'm going to attempt, this has got some pretty good flat spots that all line up, 
So, I think I'm going to attempt to print this like this. It'll give me a lot better detail, I think. At least I think it will. I don't see any dramatic overhangs that'll break. I mean, these all have angles. This one's a little bit, but I've done worse and it printed fine. I don't know. But if I print it like this, I might not even need any support. Just some brim discs to latch on might be enough. The printer is so smooth that that might work. So I think I'm going to try printing it like this. And it'll also let me print it a little bit bigger on the end or two. And we'll go from there. Yeah, I think that might work. I'll have to look at the model more carefully, but I think that will work. Yeah, that is a wing. It is an overhang. So like this will be fine. We'll see. I'm, I'm going to reprint this. Especially before I try to supersize it on the CR-10. Although this might not need to be. It's a shuttlecraft, so it doesn't necessarily have to be huge. But we'll see. For now, that's garbage bin material. All right. I have a question for you guys. I need to make money from this, even if I only make enough to pay for what I do in these videos. I have my Amazon affiliate links, and I have my GearBest links, and I make it a point to only provide links and suggestions on stuff I actually use. So I have videos and affiliate links for the Ender 2 because I use the Ender 2 for the CR-10 because I use the CR-10, ANET E10, Wanhao Duplicator i3, etc, etc. I use these things, so I have links for them. Um, anything I review is after I've used it, okay? Now, ANET appears to actually pay pretty well. <laughs> um, I sold two CR-10s through them, which I'm not ashamed of at all. It's a freaking amazing printer, and the payout's pretty damn good. So I want to try some more stuff through GearBest. Um, they want me to post links for stuff I don't have. I cannot review or suggest somebody buy something I don't have because I have no idea what it is. For example, they want me to push a link because they have a sale for the ANET A8. I'm never going to have a review for the ANET A8, not because it's a bad printer, but because it's a kit. Like it's an actual, you got to build it kit. I don't have that kind of time. I don't have six to eight hours to spend building an actual kit from parts. So it's even if they gave me one for free, I'm not going to build it because I don't have that kind of time. Are you guys okay with me putting links to purchase stuff that I don't have as long as I market appropriately? I don't have this, but it's on sale. So if you want to go review it, and on another video to see whether you like it or not, you can do that, and I will clearly mark them. I don't have this product, I have no idea how good it is, but here's a link in the sale price. Let me know if you guys are okay with that. It'll be the kind of thing where I'll mention in a video or I'll post in the description, and it'll be clearly marked each time that it's something I don't have, because that's a moral line I don't want to cross. I don't want to say, go buy this printer, this thing is great, and I've never used it. It might be great! or it might be garbage. <laughs> Without having used it, I can't tell. So that's an important distinction that I want to be careful with. Um, beyond that, I got more motor retainers printing here. I have the Vulcan Starship printing over there. That is the Vulcan Starship from Enterprise, the Enterprise TV series. Um, I've got that little tea cart thing that my dad had cleared off. I'm going to put the two duplicators on that cart so that I can put the two enders here on this table here. I can actually probably fit three of them, one, two, three, right there. Especially if the print and Z works well enough that I don't have to get close to them to constantly tune them. And then the, the E10 and the second CR10 are going to go on a big stainless table there so that I can have room to use this table as a work table to work on. And um, so, that'll be fun. It'll be interesting. I'll have a review coming soon of the E action cameras. I am freaking loving these things. They're amazing. They, uh, I don't know how good they are for action cameras. Don't care. <laughs> these are my printer time-lapse cameras. I have these little tripods. And I set one up in front of each camera, either a tripod or a clamp. Where's my little clamp? Probably over there. 
So I got one holding up one camera there, but I had one holding up the camera over here. I don't know what to do with it. Over here I had room, so I switched to little tripods because it was easier than finagling. Clamp. I don't know what it is. It's these little bendy arms with a clamp and a thing that holds the camera. It works pretty good for these two. But um, for time lapse, these are amazing. They got decent low light performance. I'm happy with it. And the cool thing is, I can access them through my phone. So let me turn this one on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no SD card, I know. <laughs> um, let's see. Go into the Yi app. It's going to take a second to connect. It takes a second for the Wi Fi to come up. But I'm going to show you guys. This is really cool. Come on. Come alive. Wi Fi's on, right? Yeah. Takes about. 40 to 60 seconds, there it goes. So when you load the app, you pick what camera you have. I'm using the Yi action camera, all right? And then it scans and it finds all the cameras you've already connected. So you see I have one called Creality One and one called Wanhao i3 One because this camera is typically sitting in front of the Wanhao here and the other one's sitting in front of the CR10. And when you pick the camera, it actually connects to the camera and loads what the camera sees. So here's the camera looking at me, and here's you seeing me looking at the camera, and here's me looking at you and the camera, and you looking at the camera. <laughs> little pictureception moment there. Aww. But that's cool. You can see you get a pretty decent low lag view. It doesn't you don't need a super low lag because all you're doing is lining it up. But I just go here to time lapse, and then I I can pick what I want. So for if I, if the, if the print's going to take less than 10 hours, 12 hours, I do 30 off. What that means is every 30 seconds it takes a picture and there's no time limit, okay? For the big mega prints, I change it to 60 and off so that once every 60 seconds it takes a picture. And then all you do is hit record. Now you can't see the screen while it's recording and of course it just yelled at me for not having the SD card installed because I'm downloading the time lapse from the two enders today. But it'll then turn off and you hit back, disconnect from camera and that's it. You're good to go. And you can't log in and see how it's going unless you're local on Wi-Fi and stuff like that, but that's okay. The point is, I can bring this up, load up each of my cameras, see what they're seeing, make sure they're lined up correctly, and set my time-lapse parameters and hit go. Because, as you can tell, there's not much of an interface on the cameras itself. Okay? I got the little backpack screen for it. It. I don't know where it's at. I got the little screen that attaches to the back, but I haven't got it to work yet. It just shows up blue when I plug it in. I don't know if I got the wrong version or what, but the cameras themselves are cool, and these things are only 70 bucks on Amazon. That's crazy. I'm trying to find them used because 70 bucks is a lot <laughs> when you want to buy eight of them. <laughs> so it's, I buy them every once in a while when I have the money, but 70 bucks ain't bad, especially if you only got one printer. It's one buy. You're good. And the cool thing is, you can do time-lapse pictures, the old way, where it just snaps pictures and you have a folder full of pictures, or you can do it the way I do it, time-lapse video. So you go to the video menu and pick time-lapse. No processing. All right. Once you get it going, it takes a picture at whatever interval you tell it to, and it makes an MP4 for you. So when you plug it into the computer, your MP4 is done, it's ready to go. You pop the memory card out, stick it in the computer, grab your MP4, and do whatever you want with it. You're done. That's it. The only thing I ever have to do to edit them is, you know, chop off the end. If I'm not home and, it, and it's done recording and nobody's here to stop it, I'll have to get rid of all that dead space at the end of the video. But even if the dead space is only, in, if it's an hour, it doesn't matter. It's only 60 frames. That's, what, three seconds? <laughs> it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. But if I'm here, if I'm gone for a couple of days, I'll have to get rid of that excess on the end. And the files are small. Like the, um, the Revenge of the Cat. I think that was 121 megabytes. It's nothing, and that's 1080p, because it's only a frame every 60 seconds. So the resultant file is pretty small, and the quality, and you, you see it, the quality is great. All my time-lapse videos um, for the last several weeks, for the last month, have been with these little cameras right here. And when you're done, you just press and hold, and it beeps, turn it off, and you pop the memory card out of the back, and you stick it in your computer, and do whatever you want with it. But these things are great. Um, anything else new?
Nope. That's it. Now, oh, something else you might want to keep handy for working with your prints is, um, you know, super glue. Sorry, no acrylate. Really? Can't even hang on to the little bottle. I gotta drop it. This is Gorilla Super Glue Gel, but it doesn't matter what kind. Don't get the thin stuff, it's a pain in the ass. Make sure you get the gel. Whatever brand you want, it doesn't matter. I'll provide a link in the description to some brand on Amazon, but it really doesn't matter. Just get gel. Um, stay away from the dollar store super glues. I have yet to get one that works. The liquid bottles work, but the gels, they're always dried out when I get them, or they're empty. I, mean, I don't know, I've never gotten a pack that actually works. But something else you need is accelerator. I'll post a link to this on Amazon as well. Um, this is the kind I prefer, Bob Smith's Industries um, Instaset, because it doesn't reek. Um, most of these, you know, this smells, it actually smells good. <laughs> it's got like a um, allspice caramel kind of scent to it. It's a pleasant odor. A lot of these um, accelerators for CA glue, oh, they, they make you want to cry. They're horrible. They're nasty. This is the only brand. I've been using this for 20 years. I even bought a a big giant bottle so I can refill my bottle because I also, you, this bottle will last you months and months and months and months and months with 3D printing because you need so little but I also build rockets and airplanes and stuff with CA glue I use the rubberized stuff, it's the black CA glue, they call it some of the tire glue but it's got rubber in it so it has a little give, it's not so brittle for 3D prints that doesn't matter though, just use the whatever CA is available but um, this is like 7 bucks and um, but what you do is you glue your part together, make sure you got no glue on your fingers, and then you just give it a little spritz, and that's it. Blow on it, dry like that. You don't have to wait. You don't have to worry about the part moving, things shifting. That's how I did the the, the Voyager. You know, I, I made sure the parts mated. I cleaned up the joint as best I could. You know, make sure I liked the way it mated. I covered the one joint in a little bit of glue, put the two together, made sure it lined up the way I wanted to, and then. That's it. It's done. It's not going to move on you now. You don't have to worry about it moving apart and shifting. And it holds just fine. But that stuff is handy. I also got this in. I'm going to experiment with printing with nylon. And apparently, um, Garolite is what you need for nylon to stick. So I got a big 12 by 12 piece for the CR10. It'll be a while before I mess with nylon. And I also got a much thicker than I was expecting. I should have got thinner, but a 6x12, which I'm going to cut in half so I can have two 6x6 pieces for my enders. So I can experiment with printing with nylon because I think um, I'll get stronger parts when I print these little itty bitty 13 millimeter motor retention mounts. I think I'll get better results if I use nylon because nylon is ridiculously strong. And um, plus, I just want to play with nylon. And that's a new filament. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to play with it. It's getting reasonably affordable. It's like 40 bucks a kilo or something like that, 35 bucks a kilo. Expensive as far as filament goes, but when you're printing stuff like this, you're going to get thousands of them out of a kilo of filament. Because this weighs, what, half a gram? <laughs> it's, and there's no support, there's no raft or anything like that. So things like this just don't use much plastic. Here's one of the other ones. This is the actual, I just took it right off the printer. <laughs> this is the... Um, this is the part. See, this gets glued onto your model. It's like here's a, a 13 millimeter body tube. We, I think we call this a BT5. And so this part here, it's glued onto your tube. That gets glued on there and it stays put. And then you, you stick your 13 millimeter motor in there. And then you take this and you screw it on top of the motor. And now your motor can't come off. Your motor is locked into the model. And when you're done flying the model, you can unscrew it take out your old motor, put your new motor in, and screw it back in. Done. Very, very cool. For sport models, this is great because it makes it convenient. You get a sure lock. You know your parts can stay put. And um, you get positive retention. You know it's not going to go nowhere. And then you get easy without tearing anything apart. Normally we either tape the motor in or friction fit the motor in or you'll have a little metal spring with a hook on the end of it that holds the motor in. But you gotta bend that to get it off. It could be a pain in the ass when you're working this small. Um, it tends to distend your material so your your tube gets destroyed over time as you do it more and more, especially if you tape or friction fit. You can see here how the tube gets tore up as you're working with it. Um, but you glue this on there, not only does it reinforce the end of your tube and keep it nice and clean, but there's no stress removing and adding the motor because 
It's just a threaded cap. You just thread that on there and that's it. Your motor is locked in place. You have a block inside here so your motor can't go in that way and this keeps your motor from coming out this way when the ejection charge fires. And when you're done, you unscrew this, your motor pops right out, you pop a new motor in and you lock the new motor in place. That easy. And by the way, that's no cleanup. That's how it comes off the printer. That's how good this Ender 2 is. These are printed at 100 microns because they're a little dirty at 200 mics. The um, 24 and 29 I print at 200 mics, but the 13 and, and 18 millimeter I print at... Um, I don't even know if that's printing. Yes, it is. I never checked. Um, but these print better at 100 mics. They're much, much better. And um, That's it. That's pretty cool stuff. I love being able to make my own stuff. I mean, it is so neat to be able to take something I designed and have it spit out of a printer and you're good to go. That's that's awesome. I think I showed you guys the new nose cover. But here's the latest one I printed today. Same nose cover. I'm, i got to make a bunch of them. But um, I still need to figure out how to get rid of the zipper. I mean, the zipper is very minor and it's barely visible, as you can see there. It's like nothing. I, uh, I'm tempted just to leave it, but I would love to be able to figure out how to tune that out. It's such a consistent mark that there has to be something I can do that is also consistent that will erase it. This is barely there. It's barely visible. You can hardly even feel it. It's probably a, it's probably not even 0.1 millimeter um, in thickness. It's, it's hardly there. You can barely scratch it with your nail, but um, I'd like to get rid of it. It doesn't affect performance or quality, but I'd like to get rid of it. But you can see... I'm learning how to use Fusion 360, and I was able to chamfer, and then, um, is it a chamfer? No, I think it's a a bevel and a chamfer, a fillet, I'm sorry, a, a, um, a chamfer to get this angle, and then a fillet to curve the end of it, and it prints great. The, the point of that is, is so that when you insert the nose cone into the tube, the perfect fitting nose cone doesn't tear apart the imperfect edge. You can see inside of here how the edge of the tube, let's see, where is it at? Right here. You see how the inside edge of the tube starts to get tore up a little bit because you know the edge of your nose cone, the sharp edge will catch. Well, because now this is the correct diameter for the tube, this is much smaller. It's two millimeters smaller at the bottom here, or three millimeters, two or three millimeters. But that's enough that you can see it goes right in, no resistance because it's so much smaller than the tube. And then that smooth curved edge going from the chamfer to the proper diameter just pushes the tube evenly and cleanly out of the way and you get a perfect insertion. So that is cool. That's something that's difficult to do in a manufacturing process, but matter of fact, I believe that's damn near impossible to do. Not impossible, but hard because you're making the part smaller. I don't know how that would work, but they usually don't do that. It's usually just a curved edge. And that'll, in 3D printing, I can do that though, and it just inserts so perfectly. It's really pretty cool. On this one, I have one of my orange ones. This is 29 millimeter. So I can actually, I can show you how this works. So this is your motor. That's a, I, I think that's a three, no, it's a four grain 29 millimeter. So this would be H and possibly baby eyes, big motors. You could certify level one with this, and, um, or maybe more. I don't know. It's a four grain motor. That means you can have up to 250 grams of propellant here. And um, so I think there's 62.5 grams of grain, I believe. But um, so this gets glued on. This gets glued onto the model. You can see I even got my orange centering rings in there. Actually, they're the white ones. Or the orange. Yeah, they're the white ones. But um, this is all 3D printed. The only thing, the only thing in this entire model not 3D printed is the motor tube and the body tube. Just because there's no practical reason to print a body tube. Why? When the paper tube is so much cheaper and better for the job. So, motor retainer gets glued on. Your motor then inserts through the retainer. And then your cap threads on top of that. And now the motor is locked in place. See, the hole here is smaller than the edge of the motor. So it locks the motor in place. Now your motor can't go anywhere. You go fly your rocket. And when it comes back, you simply unscrew it. Pull your motor out, prep it for another flight, reinsert your motor, thread it back in place, and you're good to go. That is cool. 
uh, Essie's and other companies sell these for like 20 bucks for pairs. So you're paying 10 to 15 dollars each for these. I can print them for a lot less. <laughs> so. And I can do something other manufacturers can't really do. They will never make a 13 or 18 millimeter. It's just not going to happen because they would have to make a very expensive injection mold to make these two pieces. And they're never going to sell enough of these to justify that massive capital expense. My capital expense to make these was two hours of my time <laughs> and a nickel's worth of plastic, if that. So I can do things they can't do. I can't do it in the kind of scale they can do it. They can call up the manufacturer and you know order 29 millimeter motor retainers and say, we need 10,000 of them. <laughs> and they'll be done in a few days. Um, I couldn't make 10,000 in a year. I couldn't make 10,000 in five years. But I can make dozens of them, a couple hundred of them, very easily and very affordably on my printer. 3D printers, if you can find a niche where it works, three, and I haven't made a dime on this yet, I'm hoping to make money selling these parts. I'm about to send some off to a retailer who's going to look at them and see if he likes them. Um, if you can find a niche, 3D printing is the ultimate in JIT production. I mean, just in time production. I can make a kit, keep only two or three of the kits in stock, just two or three of them sitting on my shelf here. And when someone buys one, I go to the printer and say, you print me another retainer, you print me another centering ring, you print me another centering ring, you print me a nose cone, and you know, you print me a camera mount. And then in a couple of hours, all those parts are done, I throw together a new kit, I just replace the kit I made. <laughs> it's, it's, that's what 3D printing lets you do. It's really freaking cool. So. Well, this video is getting long in the tooth. I'm approaching 30 minutes, so it's called a night. Let me know what you guys think about the, the gear best links and stuff like that. It's a chance for me to make some money that pays for all this stuff, but if I make you guys angry, that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> you got to have viewers in order for those kind of things to work. So let me know what you think about that.